afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Herbst. I am president of American Jewish University, and welcome to another MAVEN program. It's a pleasure today to welcome Professor Robert Mnookin to the platform. He's the Samuel Williston Professor of Law, at Har of, of Law at Harvard Law School, the director of the Harvard Negotiation Research Project, and for 25 years chaired the program in negotiation at Harvard Law School. He's had a remarkable career developing an interdisciplinary approach, negotiation and conflict resolution. He's written or edited 10 books and published numerous scholarly articles. And between 1994 and 2003, he served on the International Board of the New Israel Fund as its secretary and treasurer. Bob, welcome and congratulations on the new paperback edition of the book. Jeffrey, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, maybe you could tell us why you decided to write the book, The Jewish American Paradox, Embracing Choice in a Changing World. I think what motivated me to write this book was becoming a grandfather. Uh, we have two daughters, uh, and they're now very middle-aged, and uh, they each had two children. And what I realized about 10 years ago is notwithstanding the fact that my wife and I are uh, not religiously observant. We both grew up as reformed Jews in the Midwest during the period of classical reform. Neither of us ever had bar or bat mitzvahs. Uh, that nonetheless, part of me really hoped that my grandchildren would grow up to have a Jewish identity. And I asked myself, what's this all about uh, in terms of how you've, in fact, conducted your life for the most part up to this point? Uh, why is that important to you? And so I became very interested intellectually in issues of Jewish identity. And I ended up writing a book about it and about the challenges I see the American Jewish community facing. Bob, we hope as many people as possible will buy the book and uh, information on the book is in the chat function, but maybe you could tell the audience, what is the Jewish American paradox? Well, the paradox in my view is the following. You know, on the one hand, in the 2000 years of the diaspora of Jews, there's never been a time or place where Jews were so well integrated into a society as is true in the United States today. You know, by all measures, our success in terms of contributions, educationally, scientifically, economically, philanthropically, artistically, it's just extraordinary. You know, until recently, we had three justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, our average family income is uh, substantially higher than the American average. Uh, by all measures, uh, we've done extraordinarily well. Nonetheless, notwithstanding all this success, my own feeling is there's a substantial amount of anxiety about what's to become of the American Jewish community. Um, uh, uh, in terms of our identity, will our grandchildren and great-grandchildren see themselves as Jews? Or instead, are we gonna sort of gradually, except for maybe a couple conspicuous groups, largely vanish? Uh, I don't think the American Jewish community as a whole is gonna vanish at all because I think there'll still be uh, Orthodox Jews who are deeply observant. And indeed, I think there'll also be fervent Zionists who are gonna remain and have a very strong Jewish identity. But I think there's a lot of anxiety about what's gonna to happen to the, to the rest of us. Bob, a good part of the book uh, is devoted to the question, who is a Jew or who should be considered a Jew? Uh, and why don't we try to explicate your argument by first saying, what's your critique of current definitions and practices? Well, uh, my, my concern is the book is in many ways 
provides a substantial argument against using the matrilineal principle to define who could be part of the American Jewish community as a whole. I think given the fact of intermarriage, which is not going to change, and which in fact uh, uh, today, if you put aside the Orthodox that are about 10%, uh, in the last 20 years, 70% of Jews who married intermarried. And I think the, the question of will their children be accepted by the Jewish community and be raised as Jews is a very important question. And I'm deeply concerned that the matrilineal principle, which of course provides that you have to have a Jewish mother, means that half these, half the children of intermarried uh, kids uh, uh, under the matrilineal principle won't count as Jewish unless they undergo a formal religious conversion. And uh, uh, so uh, what I've discovered in my research is a number of things. First, you know, as you know, uh, the reform movement and the reconstructionist movement now accept as Jewish children who have a Jewish father as well as a Jewish mother. Uh, uh, second, what I learned, of, of course, well, not of course, but I think it's quite relevant, is that nowhere in the Torah or the Old Testament is there anything suggesting that the matrilineal principle applied. Indeed, many of the patriarchs uh, conspicuously married non-Jews, and there was never a suggestion, for example, that their children <laughs> weren't Jewish, weren't members of the tribe, and yet there was no formal conversion. The requirement of a formal conversion and the matrilineal principle really arose out of the Mishnah and rabbinical Judaism around the year 200 of the Common Era. So, I mean, in fact, it's a little bit of an embarrassment, I think, for conservative and orthodox rabbis, although the matrilineal principle has plenty of historical precedent, it do, is not, doesn't go back far enough in terms of the Old Testament, at least. Uh, I think the problems with it is it's both under-inclusive and over-inclusive. What do I mean by that? It's under-inclusive in that, in fact, the matrilineal principle would exclude many people who completely identify as Jews and, in fact, uh, for whom a Jewish identity is quite a central part of their being, and they're leading lives informed by that identity. Uh, on the other hand, it's over-inclusive, too, because it leads to many Jews characterizing as Jewish people who do not identify themselves as Jews, who maybe have even converted to another religion. Uh, so I end up in the book struggling with well, what ought to be the test. And I can and say- you, you, you have a couple of chapters devoted to other criteria. Uh, we'll get to, you've developed your own, but I, you also provide a critique of some other ideas and maybe right. you could go through those. Well, one idea I had and I explored, well, maybe to be Jewish, uh, you have to have certain beliefs. Uh, many religions have what I characterize as a catechism. They have certain core beliefs that if you don't have them, you can't belong, you, know, you, you won't be considered a member of that religion. Well, Although Maimonides tried to develop a set of principles that he thought were absolutely indispensable, there is no catechism for Judaism. Maimonides' principles were criticized by many other rabbis, and there's no agreement about what those criteria would be. And indeed, in America today, for example, roughly a quarter of people who identify themselves as Jewish say they don't believe in God. They don't believe in a personal God certainly don't believe in the God of the Old Testament. And another 25% are agnostic. So if, if you had a standard that required a certain set of beliefs, you'd eliminate a very substantial percentage of people who now consider themselves Jewish. 
Another criteria might be, if you want to be Jewish, you've got to belong to a synagogue. You've got to affiliate. Well, it turns out in America, for example, only roughly one out of three American Jewish families uh, are dues-paying members of a synagogue. The other two-thirds are not. Uh, this is a much lower percentage than among those who self-identify as Christians. People who self-identify as Christians, about 60% belong. So once again, if you had as a criteria that you had to belong to a Jewish institution, you'd eliminate a substantial fraction of people in America who consider themselves Jews. So I think neither a test that required belief or, or a test that required uh, participation or observance, it, it would eliminate lots of people who think of themselves as Jewish. Well, let's go now to what your preferred definition is or approach and how that aligns with your understanding of the Jewish American paradox. Well, my approach, uh, which the New York Times in its review of my book characterized as revolutionary, and then it said, quote, some would say heretical uh, revision uh, is as follows. And I struggled to sort of find an approach uh, that would uh, be sufficiently welcoming. My approach, it, well, first of all, I differentiate between what the criteria should be for being part of the American Jewish community writ large as a whole. Uh, un, I, I think of the American Jewish community as a whole as a big tent. And under that big tent, there are synagogues of various denominations. There are philanthropic organizations, artistic organizations, uh, all kinds of institutions. Jewish institutions. And uh, my own view is that the test for admission to the big tent should be, do you publicly self-identify yourself as a Jew? And if you identify yourself as a Jew publicly, uh, that's good enough for me. I'm not going to quiz you on whether your mother was Jewish, whether your father was Jewish, or whether you had undergone a conversion. You're welcome to the big tent. The second prong of the Manukin test, though, says that the institutions under the Big Ten can have their own membership requirements. If Orthodox synagogues want to say, to be a member of our synagogue, to be considered Jewish for purposes of membership in our institution, this synagogue, you've got to have a Jewish mother or you've got to undergo a conversion of our kind of conversion. I think that's fine. In other words, I think the institutions under the Big Tent can have their own definitions of who counts as a Jew, but I don't want them applying it to the community as a whole. Now, some institutions under the Big Tent uh, already have uh, very liberal uh, definitions. I mean, for example, uh, reform congregations and even conservative congregations today allow spouses who have not converted to be members of their institution. There may be some limitations, particularly in the conservative movement, as to what they can do. But anyway, that's a somewhat more liberal standard than simply the matrilineal test. Jewish I'll community, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just saying, a Jewish community center typically has no requirement at all. You don't even have to be Jewish to be a member of that Jewish institution. Moreover, there are all kinds of Jewish philanthropies that would be glad to take your money, whether you're Jewish or not. For sure. I, I suspect that's true of the American Jewish University. It is indeed true of the American Jewish University. But why was solving what you call the boundary problem, how to, where the line is drawn, as it were, between Jews and non-Jews, so important for you in addressing the American Jewish paradox? Well, I, I, the reason I think it's of practical importance, although I know, you know it's not gonna be accepted broadly tomorrow by 
a number of the institutions under the Big Ten, is I think it's terribly important in the years to come in America for us to be very welcoming to people who want to participate in American Jewish life. And I think the dissent elements of our tribalism historically uh, cut the wrong way. And in fact, uh, uh, make it harder uh, for us to uh, retain uh, many people who otherwise, I think, would be quite interested in having a Jewish identity, but who mm -hmm. aren't conventionally religious. You note in the book that this broad definition would include people by descent, people who had grandparents, non-Jewish spouses, all of, that, all of those people, as you know in the book, are eligible, in fact, for Aliyah now. But you also go on to say that would include um, uh, people who had uh, Jewish grandparents, but not Jewish parents, and then go any, go any further and says that it would include anyone who had any Jewish heritage, and which we can define now through genetic testing, as well as, as well as people who are adults who are by birth Jewish, but had ties to another religion. So that seems to be a kind of a maximalist definition of who, is, who might be Jewish. Is that fair enough to say? I think it's fair. I think it's fair. And, and I, I realize, uh, you know, it is, it is possible to test that definition with what are, in my view, extremely unlikely and fairly <laughs> absurd examples that are unlikely to occur. But uh, what I'm most concerned about are people who, A, may not have any Jewish heritage, but are tempted to want to explore it and participate. And B, as you indicated, people that discover they may have a Jewish ancestor, uh, but who wouldn't meet the descent requirements of the matrilineal rule. Uh, I'm, of course, most concerned about children who have a Jewish parent. Um, I think the stunning thing and the very the thing that makes me very optimistic, and it's important to, to note, is recent studies have suggested that 60% of the children of intermarried couples where the non-Jewish spouse has never converted are being raised as Jews. And indeed, if you go to reform congregations today, the proportion of bar and bat mitzvahs where involving a non-Jewish parent is just remarkably high. And it's also <laughs> true, becoming true in, in, in conservative synagogues uh, a, a, as well, uh, uh, because there are uh, many more now in the conservative movement too. And I think that what's extraordinary is, and I think it's a, a, a fabulous thing that these, uh, non-Jewish spouses are often actively participating. And um, um, uh, as I say, that gives me some real optimism. Bob, just to round out your description, when you say publicly identifies Jewish, so what does that mean? <laughs> it means different things to different people. I mean, you know, I am not a, uh, an identity essentialist. Let me explain what I mean by that. I think particularly today, when you, in some degrees, with respect to American politics, uh, people emphasize one element of someone's identity, and they use that as being a complete description. You know, are you a Hispanic? Are you a woman? Are you a Jew? I, my own belief is, we all have many strands to our identity. If you ask me, who are you, Bob Manukin? I'd say, I'm a, Midwest, I'm a Midwesterner by birth. Being from Kansas City is a big part of my identity. 
uh, I'm a father, a grandfather, and have various familial roles. That's a big part of my identity. Uh, another big part of my identity is I'm a Jew and I'm an American and I'm a lawyer and I'm a mediator and I'm a law professor. These are all elements of our identity. And I think that in fact, in terms of identity, a strand of your identity can assume greater or lesser importance and it can vary during your lifetime. And so I think that that's part of what we've got to make room for too, is, is that uh, I tell a very poignant story in my book about the spouse of a professional friend of mine, a woman who was raised uh, as an Episcopalian, who married a Jewish man, raised two children who were bar and bat mitzvahs, bar and bat mitzvah. Unfortunately, she developed cancer in middle age, and the hospice nurse asked her, uh, what's your religion? And she paused and began to say none. And then she ended up saying Jewish, even though she had never converted, but she had belonged to a temple and she had participated in it. And, and obviously she thought of herself <laughs> at that point as wanting to really express her Jewish identity. And she, of course, th there, there was a memorial service for her uh, in that temple as well there should have been. But I, I think that I found that story very poignant. And I was, think, I, I was really thinking to myself, why in the world should she not be accepted as part of that community, uh, uh, even though she never converted? Well, the, the skeptics might say that uh, the traditional definitions and practices, however flawed, and you point out some of them, allowed Jews after the fall of the Second Temple, when they might have been expected to disappear into the midst of time, uh, to nonetheless survive for the next 1800 years. Uh, you're arguing for a departure from that as a new survival strategy. Does that give you pause? Uh, that you're abandoning something that worked, however imperfectly, for two millennia for something else? Well, no, I think that <laughs> what, quote, worked, end quote, in my view, was not the matrilineal principle. It was a tradition of endogamy, <laughs> and it was anti-Semitism. Uh, endogamy means that, of course, you marry within the tribe. And there was a traditional, very strict rule that a marriage wouldn't be recognized uh, if you married outside the tribe. That combined with a world that was very hostile to Jews for the most part, because we didn't convert to Christianity, at least in the Western world. Uh, I think that's what, <laughs> in my view, <laughs> Those elements were what contributed much more than the matrilineal principle. Uh, it, it was, in fact, uh, the, the somewhat coercive effect of those two things. I think, though, we now live in an era of choice, where, in fact, the norm of endogamy now is not accepted as appropriate by the younger generation. And particularly in a society like our own where Jews are so well integrated. And you know, it's inevitable that a lot of young people are gonna meet people with whom they share a great deal in common, but may not share the religion. And where uh, one of the stunning aspects of the changes in American life is the acceptance by non-Jews of having their kids marry Jews. You know, I have a lot of talk about anti-Semitism in America appropriately now because there, we were, we're, there still is, there still are anti-Semites, but nonetheless, the social acceptance of Jews uh, is really quite stunning. Uh, you're concerned, I know, as we all are, about polarization in the United American society. You see polarization in Israel right now. 
we see polarization in the American Jewish community also. Uh, are you concerned that, let's say, a big tent approach, yours or something like it, is in some ways a recipe for increased polarization as the different groups, denominations, factions call you what they want, call you call them what you want, go their own way without much of a common thread? Well, I, you know, I. Uh, uh, I think that is a risk. On the other hand, what I think is what I adore about the American Jewish community is its variety. I've had students, Haredim, those whose whole life centered around being Jewish. Beginning about a decade or so ago, Harvard Law School, believe it or not, accepted some kids who graduated from a yeshiva but did not graduate from a university. And I've had some of these young people as student, young men, they're not women, uh, uh, as students. And it's been fantastic for me. I've learned a lot from them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the variety of American Jews, the interests of American Jews is just stunningly varied. I think that's great. And I, for one, I don't want to tell anybody how to be Jewish. I don't want to tell anybody whether to be Jewish. I think it's really should be a matter of their individual decision and choices. But I personally uh, think that a tolerance of difference is terribly important. And I think one thing, for example, that I think is a, uh, an aspect of a, of a political aspect in Israel today that's very troubling for many of us who are, for example, Reformed Jews, is that within Israel, the Haredim, the most Orthodox, really have had the ability, largely for many purposes, to define within Israel who counts as a Jew, what is a Jew, where they can, who can be buried where. Uh, um, and uh, I, they make statements episodically about how, for example, Reformed Jews shouldn't even count as Jewish. I think that's fair. That that kind of intolerance, that kind of religious intolerance within Israel is very troubling. And um, I write about it in the book. Um, I want to ask one last question, then go to the considerable number of questions we have from the audience. Please keep submitting them. You write in the book about a chapter to anti-Semitism, and you admit that your thinking evolved somewhat uh, as you wrote the book. Um, I think you were more sanguine at the beginning of the book uh, than at, at the end. I haven't read the updated paperback edition uh, where you've updated that chapter further, but you note that structural anti-Semitism, the, the refusal of, let's say, universities to accept Jews has okay. been has declined markedly, if not eliminated, um, but that other, and that Jews are socially accepted and that uh, anti-Semitism as common, as was commonly defined is on the wane. Uh, but you did, you were still writing that book when Charlottesville happened, um, when the uptick in anti-Semitic events. And since the book has published, most uh, people who count, even though you have some criticisms of the counters, um, suggest that anti-Semitic incidents have continued to increase. Does your fundamental conclusions, however, still hold about the waning influence overall of anti-Semitism and how that plays into your definitional concerns? Well, look, I, I think that 90% um, of Americans today, when polled, say they think that anti-Semitism is a problem in America. And 40% characterize it as a serious problem. And I think in the light of uh, uh, the time of life synagogue killings, the hostage taking, Charlottesville, uh, social networks, uh, which I think have had quite a negative effect in many ways, in terms of anti-Semitism, uh, 
uh, anyone who claims there are no anti-Semites in America is a fool. Uh, and I think with the rise of white supremacy, there has been an increase in anti-Semitic incidents. Nonetheless, I argue, and I deeply believe, that institutionalized anti-Semitism no longer exists in America and is not gonna soon reappear. What do I mean by that? I mean, neighborhoods that Jews can't buy. If I think about my grandparents' generation, there were neighborhoods that were, quote, restricted. There were um, um, resorts that wouldn't take Jews. Uh, there were law firms in the 1950s that wouldn't hire Jews. There were industries that wouldn't take Jews. There was all kinds of institutionalized anti-Semitism that affected the economic and social opportunities of American Jews substantially. And I think what we've got to keep in, in perspective is that's no longer true. Uh, and I think compared to other minorities, Jews are comparatively very well off. On the other hand, I, you know, I think vigilance is required. And, um, I, I, and you're quite right that since I started working on the book, you know, you, I, I've got to acknowledge that there are more, there in terms of um, uh, vandalism, uh, uh, some kinds of harassment, it still exists and uh, we should worry about it. Uh, let's go to the audience, uh, which has asked a considerable number of questions, and I'll try to get through as many as possible. One member of the audience writes, do you include Messianic Jews in the Big Ten? <laughs> Probably not the first time you've gotten that. No, it's not the first time. And uh, in terms of the Big Ten, my answer is yes. In terms of my reform congregation, no. In terms of uh, Jewish philanthropies, if they want to participate, it's fine with me. But, you know, I and that is, that's the hardest one. That's the hardest one. Because you're right that they do self-identify as Jews. Uh, another member of the audience writes about, um, writes, will the two-part standard of Jewish identity create two tiers of Jews in a synagogue community? And let me broaden that slightly because and ask you, where do you see synagogues in this Jewish American future, which you write about, um, given, given your concerns, given what you're trying to extrapolate? Uh, you know, I, I, I think they play there. I think they're going to play. A, they're going to play a critical role of two of three sorts. One is they provide a community. I think that many members of synagogues enjoy it for the communal aspects of it rather than for a narrowly defined religious aspect of it. And I think that's terrific. I think a second function they perform is educational, particularly for young people. That's where uh, even for secular friends, particularly intermarried secular friends, if they care about raising their children as Jews, I say in the book, you ought to join a temple or synagogue because providing your kids with some education about what, what the religion is about, what the history is about, without education, it's not gonna have any meaning. And I, I think in fact, temples and synagogues and, and day schools play a very important role in that respect. Day schools are a new development since I was a kid. Uh, uh, and I think the third dimension of course, is they provide opportunities for religious observance. And for those Jews who are religiously observant, you know, there's no doubt that I think probably the best glue to hold people in terms of a Jewish identity is if they are observant. 
And, and part of the reason I wrote the book, and I part of me wishes the liturgy emotionally meant more to me than it does. But I have to acknowledge those dimensions for me don't mean a lot uh, to me. Uh, forgive the long-winded answer and I'll just be abbreviated, but uh, you know, I asked myself at the end of the book, if my grandchildren ask me, what's important to you about being Jewish? Uh, my answer is three things. What I call the Jewish head, and the Jewish head is we are people of the book. We believe in intellectual argument, analysis. Uh, education is really a primary value of ours. A second dimension is what I call the Jewish heart. And by Jewish heart, what I mean is tikkun olam. Although in a reform congregation where I was confirmed at 15, my education in terms of Judaism was thin. The one thing I really learned was the idea that central to Judaism was the idea that we had to help heal the world. And, and we had to think about helping not only other Jews, but also the world be a better place. And the third dimension for me, apart from the Jewish head and the Jewish heart, is the Jewish heritage. I have found the study of Jewish history and the history of our people, including the in many ways, the history of Jews in America, which is so fascinating, a source of great pleasure. So for me, the, that, that's what it is. But on the, on the other hand, for many people, it's more religious. And for them, of course, the synagogue is gonna play a critical role. Uh, another member of the audience writes, has writing the book changed how you think about your identity? as a Jew. Yes. It, it, I, I think that the Jewish dimension of my identity has become much more important to me. It's much more central, no doubt. What surprised you the most, if I could editorialize, from when you conceptualized this book to when you finished it? That's a great question. I really... I have to think about it even longer, but I think that one of the great pleasures for me in doing the book uh, was learning more about the history of Jews in America, which I think is quite a remarkable story, going back to the 17th century even. And uh, the arrival of different groups of Jews, the conflicts among those groups, um, how we've evolved. Uh, I absolutely found it. I learned a lot and I found it very, very interesting. I have a question that goes, that you devote a chapter to almost to, which we haven't talked about so far is, uh, one member of the audience writes, uh, does the fact that some genetic testing classifies people as Jewish, or as you know, part Jewish. Right. Does that make us a race or what are we? Uh, uh, the answer is no, <laughs> in my view. Uh, there is no inherent biological dimension uh, to Jews. Uh, what is true is that many Jews myself included, uh, uh, it's particularly true of Ashkenazi Jews, uh, share uh, certain genetic characteristics. Uh, and, uh, but those characteristics are both, forgive the expressions again, under-inclusive and over-inclusive. The, the, the genes that many Jews share also are shared by other peoples, many of whom originated in the Middle East uh, on the one hand. Uh, and there are many people who are Jewish and have been Jewish for centuries who don't have these genes. So there is no simple test. Uh, 
Uh, uh, and and I think the, the it what's what's interesting, of course, if you study the issue of are Jews a race, uh, is that in the 19th century, m- many Jews characterized our we characterized ourselves as a race, uh, and uh, that was often done to encourage or discourage intermarriage. Uh, there's some perfectly appalling statements <laughs> around the turn of the century by, believe it or not, some reform rabbis saying the reason you shouldn't intermarry is you're going <laughs> to dilute the race, uh, which uh, I think by today's standards, um, and, and the, uh, given the l- later history during Nazi Germany, is pretty appalling. Uh, we're running out of time, and I'm not going to get to all the audience questions, but I did want to ask you about it. I'm not sure you touch on the book, but it's important. One of the most striking developments in 20th century, 21st century American Judaism is the rise of Chabad, um, which may might not have been predicted, um, which has both a kind of a big tent approach, but uh, a different, uh, in other ways, a different approach than yours. How do you interpret Chabad's success? I think that's a great question. And, and I think their strategy on college campuses of being incredibly welcoming, of always having both a rabbi and the the rabbitzin, the rabbi's wife, uh, uh, of of having Shabbat dinners where they serve wine. In fact, Chabad has gotten in trouble at certain universities. They've even been kicked off a university or two because they were serving wine to people that were under 21 uh, in universities where you know you, you had to be 21. Uh, but it's part of their uh, uh, Shabbat services. Uh, uh, but I, I think the welcoming dimension and the personal dimension of their approach, I think is, uh, uh, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn. And I think the other thing is they, in a curious way, I don't think they're very preachy. I mean, I think their own form of Judaism is very, Orthodox, but um, they, uh, um, I, I, you know, all I can report is that they are they are effective on campus, uh, and, and and that many young Jews who don't change their ways of practicing Judaism religiously, nonetheless, participate. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, I have to disappoint some of the audience who still were in the queue for questions. Uh, I advise as many people as you want to read the book. We provided information on the book in the chat function. It's the American Jewish Paradox. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you'll come back to the platform often and be a friend of AJU. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. 